we'll get started once again. Uh, so right now we are in um, the second chapter of Second Thessalonians. Uh, if we can have someone read out for us Second Thessalonians chapter two uh, verses eight to twelve. Verses eight to twelve, please. And then the lawless ones will be revealed whom the Lord Jesus will kill with the breath of his mouth and reign to nothing by the appearance of his coming. The coming of the long nights, one is by the activity of Satan, with all power and false signs of and wonders, and with all wicked deceptions for those who are perishing because they refuse to love the truth and so be saved. Therefore, God sends them a strong delusion so that they may believe what is false. In order, in order that all may be condemned, who did not believe the truth, but have pleasure in unrighteousness. Yeah, uh, there are two main points being made in this particular passage. Um, let's just look at the first thing. Uh, it talks about how this um, this lawless one, the Antichrist, uh, will be coming. And uh, he will use all kinds of signs and wonders to deceive people. So when people look at all of these signs and wonders, they may start believing, OK, here is a man who can really be our messiah, who can help us with all our situations. Um, and so you know they um, are willing to even worship him as a god because of what he is able to do. Uh, so all of that will happen. Um, and then it talks about how you, know, they, you have all these people getting uh, deceived. And then it talks about what kind of people who actually get deceived. Um, yeah, verse 10, it says, they perish because they refused to love the truth and so be saved. And then in verse 12, it says, um, you know, those who have not believed the truth but have delighted in wickedness. So there are some people who get deceived uh, because they have a delight in wickedness. They love wickedness and um, they do not have any love for the truth. And for such people, it becomes very easy to get deceived because uh, you know the, the liar is actually giving them permission to continue living in their wickedness. Uh, so it's so much easier for them to embrace that you know, rather than give up all of their wicked ways and you know, uh, love the truth. So loving the truth costs. It's expensive to love the truth. On the other hand, loving wickedness, that too has a very terrible cost. But you know, people um, uh, don't realize that. Uh, I mean, it's going to cost them their entire eternity. So yes, uh, loving wickedness is also very expensive. Uh, it will cost you your, your own soul. Uh, so, But people don't realize that. They think of loving the truth as something painful and too, uh, too expensive. And so they prefer not to love the truth. And it is such people who get deceived. So this, I mean, I know over here it's talking about uh, the people in the end times. It's talking about um, you know the, those who refuse to accept the Lord Jesus. And uh, they instead choose to you know embrace this Antichrist. It is talking about those things. Uh, but the, the you know spiritual principle over here, I think we can um, apply that even to ourselves. Um, because when we delight in something wicked, uh, it is so easier to use reasoning and arguments to try and support what we are doing. You see, we are willing to compromise on the truth. Uh, so on the other hand, if we are people who really love the truth and want to hold on to what God has said, then you know, we will be willing to go that extra mile and make those painful sacrifices uh, and uh, give up what the flesh is asking for. Uh, so, it. So when we, you know, we need to maybe examine ourselves. Yeah, maybe uh, you know, examine ourselves on a regular basis and make sure that our love for ungodly things is not on the increase. We got to kind of always curtail that. You know, keep that in check, because when our uh, what 
attraction towards the ungodly things starts to increase, we can be very, very sure that deception also will begin. Because once that attraction increases and we allow it to increase, then Satan can start blinding our eyes, you see? And once you can't see very clearly anymore, uh, the truth will no longer reveal itself to us. You know, we will look at the scriptures, we will read the Bible, but not really perceive what is being told over there. Uh, so it's a, it's a risk. It, it's, it's a very uh, serious risk. So on a regular basis, we just need to kind of keep it in check, you know, just make sure that uh, our love for the ungodly things, for the things of the world, our attraction towards those things is not on the increase. So how do we keep that kind of, you know, under control? I think it um, helps the kind of company we keep, uh, the people with whom we, you know, um, usually rub shoulders and mix with and hang out with. Uh, if they are people who are literally into all the things of the world, then yeah, we our interest in, social, in those things also will, you know, increase. So that is one uh, main thing. Another thing is uh, how much time we spend on the, you know, uh, social media where you seem to have more ungodly things being promoted rather than good things being promoted. So um, the more and more time maybe we spend on social media, um, on um, the wrong kind of, um, you know, websites which are just all about glamour and the world and the worldly values and principles. You know, whatever we're kind of feeding ourselves with, that is what tends to, you know, attract our minds, right? Uh, so we need to be very careful about this whole thing of delighting in wickedness. Because when, they, when this delight in wickedness, um, this attraction towards wickedness starts increasing, deception follows. Because Satan can use this attraction, this new attraction that we have, you know, towards wicked things. He can start using that to uh, veil our eyes. We can no longer see very clearly. And when we, when we can no longer see the beauty of the truth of God's word, we start, you know, losing out on that. And then the deception increases. So I think that's one principle that we can draw from this, even though, I mean, I admit that this passage is not actually talking about us believers. It's talking about those who will be deceived by the Antichrist. Um, now, the other main concept over here in this passage is how God deals with such people. It says over here, they perish because they refused to love the truth and, and so be saved. You know, and we see, we saw that in verse 12. Uh, why are they perishing? It's because they delight in wickedness. Um, then going back to uh, verse um, uh, 11, the beginning of verse 11, it says, for this reason, God sends them a powerful delusion so that they will believe the lie. And this has been God's um, method of dealing with the wicked. I mean, uh, throughout history, right from Old Testament times, you know, I mean, somebody wants to harden their heart uh, and God gives them various chances to, you know, repent and turn away from their wickedness. If they refuse to do that, God says, okay, fine, you really want to go on hardening your heart? Fine, in that case, I will actively help you in hardening your heart. You know, so a, re a stage is reached where God says, fine, you want to go into wickedness? Good, I will help you to get into wickedness. Go, go have your way. And that's such a dreadful thing, right? I mean, where God himself is like, uh, giving up on you, um, you know, so uh, we see that happening in the case of the Pharaoh. Pharaoh was allowed so many chances to turn around, to look at the clear demonstration of God's power and, you know, uh, believe in, in the true God. But he continued to harden his heart. And then finally, you come to that verse where it says, God hardened his heart. In the beginning, it was not that. It was just Pharaoh hardening his own heart. He chose not to, you know, he chose to turn a blind eye to all the truth that was being shown to him again and again and again. He continued to try turn a blind eye to the truth. And finally, one day, God said, fine, I will help you in hardening your heart. And God begins to harden his heart. That's a very dreadful and terrible thing. So over here, and we see in a reference to that even in our New Testament, um, maybe we can actually look at those verses. You know, um, it's always good to base our beliefs on actual scripture. Uh, so, you know, um, if we can look at, uh, if someone can read out for us Romans chapter 1, verse 21. Romans 1, 21.
uh, Romans so, 1. Yeah. So although they knew God, they did not believe in his gods or give thanks to Jesus, but they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. So you see, in the beginning, people knew God. They were aware that he is there, uh, but they didn't really like what he was asking them to do. So they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him. You know, they continued to distance themselves from him, even though they knew that what he is standing for is good and upright and holy. They continued to distance themselves from him, uh, neither glorifying him nor giving him thanks, it says. And so what happens as a result of that? Their thinking becomes futile. It becomes wasteful. It's not it's not thinking which is yielding good fruit and achieving something. Rather, it is just thinking that is, you know, taking you down waste, wasteful paths where nothing will be achieved, where nothing will, nothing good will be accomplished in your life. So their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. And then if you if we can also read verses 24 and 25, Romans 1, 24 and 25. Wherefore, God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lusts of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves, who changed the truth of God into a lie and worship and serve the creature more than the creator, who is blessed forever. Yeah, so, yeah. so it says over here, therefore God gave them over in the sinful desires of their hearts. So god gives many many multiple chances and that person you know is not interested in turning to the truth and loving it then he's he gives them over to their sinful desires it's okay fine you want to you know you want to have your way go ahead you know i'll give you I, i'll give you over to those sinful things and let them have sway over you because you don't seem to want to be rescued you don't seem to want to come back uh, to the truth and love it so he gives them over to be controlled and deluded and uh, you know deceived by the uh, sinful things and so it says over here in verse 25 they exchange the truth about god for a lie because the lie was comfortable the lie enabled them to continue living the way they wanted to live so they exchange the truth about god for a lie um and uh, and and you know in um, Romans 11, 8. This is what it says about such people. Uh, if someone could read out Romans 11, 8. Romans 11, verse 8. As it is written, God gave them a spirit of stupor, eyes that will not see, and ears that will not hear, turn to this very day. Yeah, the word over there used, you know, uh, God gave them a spirit of stupor. Oh, it's mainly talking about stupor is like when you're almost like unconscious. You know, you can almost, you know, feel nothing, sense nothing. You know, it's that kind of uh, total numbness uh, where you are you where you're almost no not aware of anything that kind of a condition so it says that god allowed them to reach that kind of a condition where they can no longer feel the guilt they can no longer feel any their they conscience pricking uh they they're they doing terrible things but they don't even feel any shame regarding those terrible things you know that uh, that, that almost that senseless condition where they where their senses are not functioning uh, you know, for, as far as, you know, godly things are concerned. So God allows them to reach that stage. Uh, why? Because, you know, they had no desire to love the truth. Um, so it becomes very, very important uh, how we guard our hearts. We should be people who are not allowing that attraction towards the world to increase so that we can continue to maintain that love that we have for the truth in our hearts with God's help. Okay, so um, these are just some principles that we could draw from this particular passage, uh, which is actually talking about the end times and how the people of that time will be 
easily deceived simply because they want to exchange the truth of God for a lie, like it says in Romans. Yeah. Uh, moving on from there, um, let us look at verse verses 13 and 14. That's 13 and 14. Yes. That's for you. We can't help but thank God for you, dear brothers and sisters, loved by the Lord. We are always thankful that God chose you to be among the first to experience salvation. The salvation that came through the Spirit who makes you holy through your belief in the truth. He called you to salvation when we told you the good news. Now, you can share in the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah, it's interesting the translation that you read out, brother, um, because uh, over there they have interpreted this uh, word first fruits as one of the first to get saved, is what it says over there. Um, but actually, uh, you know, the Thessalonian believers were not among one of the first to get saved uh, uh, because when we look at that entire region of uh, Macedonia. Um, yeah. when, when we look at that entire region of Macedonia, uh, we, we see that uh, it was actually the Phil Philippian believers who first uh, came to the Lord. And then later they started going into other regions and uh, spreading the gospel. So it's actually only later that these Thessalonian believers, you know, get saved. Uh, so the the word in the in, in the Greek that is actually used over there, it says, I think NKJV uh, puts it that way. It says, because God chose you as first fruits to be saved through the sanctifying work of the Spirit. Okay, so um, this term first fruits is used in some places as the first few people who got saved. You know, that's very, very true, which is probably why in this particular um, translation, you have that that sense being brought out. Um, let's look at some, maybe, uh, maybe at least one example of that. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 15. If someone could read out 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 16, verse 15. 1 Corinthians 16, 15. I beseech you, brother, ye know the house of Stephanas. That it is the first fruits of Achaia, and that they have addicted themselves to the ministry of the saints. Yeah, now over here, it's talking about how this household of Stephanus, this family was in fact the first family that uh, you know came to this uh, came to salvation in this region of Achaia. So over here, when it says first fruits of Achaia, it's literally talking about the first family in this entire region that you know became uh, believers. Um, all right. So if there are a few other passages where the term first fruits is used in this particular sense. But over here, um, the Thessalonian believers were not the first fruits. Uh, in the, it was the people at Philippi. You know who were the first fruits uh, because we we see that you know in, in Acts chapter 16 uh, where you have um, you know Paul gets that uh, vision of a man who's calling out for help from Macedonia and then uh, Paul uh, decides that you know this is God's way of telling him that they should go to Macedonia and so they change direction and they go to Macedonia and then the first city they go to is Philippi uh, on the Sabbath day they you know uh, go go to the outskirts of the city to, to see if there are any people that they can you know minister to uh, you know any prayer groups that meet and they find this particular group over there which is gathered um, you know on, on the outskirts Lydia and her entire group so they sit down over there and they share the gospel so you could say that you know Lydia's family and the other families which were there in that group they became the first fruits of Macedonia. Okay, so uh, the Thessalonians are not first fruits in this sense. So, which means maybe the term is being used over here in the other sense, you know, which people would have been familiar with. Um, uh, like we all know, you know, in the Old Testament times, um, 
the first fruits is basically what you bring uh, like a tank offering or a tithe or whatever you know some in that sense you bring it to the temple and uh, so uh, you you don't bring your entire crop over there to the temple uh, you just bring the one portion of it and you offer that to the lord and what are you saying when you're doing that you're basically saying in the same way i have set apart this first portion for you lord you know this very first fruits i've set it apart for you i brought it over here into the temple to set it apart for you in the same way i regard the rest of my crop also as being set apart for you you know i will use the rest of this crop i will sell it i will use the proceeds in a way that is honorable so i will consider all of my wealth as set apart for you but this first portion i'm bringing it specifically over here to show you that in the same way this first fruit this first fruits is sanctified the rest of everything that i have is also sanctified unto you you know uh, that was the way, that was the sense in which um, these first fruits were offered to god okay so um, it looks like that uh, is kind of being brought out over here in this um, you know verses that we looked at in second thessalonians uh, we will look at the details of that but yeah before we get into that uh, yes brother shay you go ahead and yeah ask your question yes i just wanted to bring up another the version you said nkjv maybe my you know i give us a better understand it says in that verse that's in nkjv and i think the same as the kjv says that for we are bound to give thanks to god always for you brethren beloved by the lord because god from the beginning chose you for salvation through sanctification by the spirit and belief in the truth to which he called you by our gospel for of the obtaining of the glory of the lord jesus christ so it seems to me like mm. i don't know if the original greek tallies with the nkgv and kjv that god in his uh manifold wisdom before we before we were born maybe that's what that's what is being communicated here that god always chose us wanted us you know to himself wanted us safe you know i don't know i, I was just thinking maybe that's what the nkgv and kjv actually is saying in relation to the original Greek, or maybe i'm wrong yeah i wish you know we had brought up this thing before the break because then i could have just quickly gone to bible hub and looked it up because in bible hub it, you know it'll show you the actual wording over there and that's uh, that would have just kind of clarified it um but right now um, i don't know whether my internet will be able to handle it if i try to open up bible hub it may cause extra strain on the internet uh, so uh, yeah it would be very very interesting to know the exact wording over there which is there you know um yeah i mean um, let's leave that for now simply because i'm not able to access that uh, because of my internet no problem pastor yeah uh okay this is the google classroom right so yeah later on maybe i can post this you know um i i will look it up let's see what the wording is over there and then um, uh, how it has been interpreted and then i can just briefly put that in the um, you know on the stream page yeah i can definitely do that yes so yes uh, so here uh, these people uh, these thessalonians uh, have been chosen as first fruits you know the first fruits which which usually are set apart for god so these thessalonian believers have been set apart for god to be saved through the sanctifying work of the spirit so um this you know the word sanctify just literally means set apart right so the, it's the holy spirit which is doing this work of setting them apart on a daily basis he's making them more and more set apart for himself uh, where in their attitudes in their in the choices they make uh, in the way they interact with one another in everything that they do um they are living set apart lives where it's always god who comes first uh, they do they doing it to honor him they doing it out of faith in him uh, so uh, it's all centered around him they are living set apart lives so god chose them to be this kind of a first fruit 
they are uh, set apart people and um, god is doing this work of setting them apart on a daily basis the, spirit, the holy spirit is doing it so it is happening through the sanctifying work of the spirit and through their continued belief in the truth of god's word okay so um, in the same way we too you know are meant to be uh, first fruits now we are not the you know the first believers in our particular region or anything like that uh, but we all are supposed to be uh, first fruits in the sense uh, we say in the same way lord the old testament people when they would come they would place one small portion over there in front of you and that was a symbol that this small portion is representative of their entire of all that they own in the same way this little portion is being set apart symbolically it indicates that the rest of what they have is also being set apart unto you so that's the way they 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 you know um they made their offering to the lord in old testament times and now we in the new testament times we are being expected uh, to be living sacrifices in the same way so we come over there to him and we offer all of ourselves to him we don't we can't just give one little portion and say you know this is all i'm giving to you and the rest of it is of it is for me uh, just like the old testament people we too are expected to give all of ourselves every aspect of us as a living sacrifice as an offering as a living offering to him you know so we would be living for him we would be doing things that will please him and honor him and so in that sense we also can be first fruits okay in that sense of the word um yeah um if we can um, move into verses 15 16 and 17 ഫോർട്ട്രൂഹ് സെവൻറ്റീൻസ് <laughs> may you know uh, may may what 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 does he want god to do for them he says may god encourage your hearts and strengthen you in every good deed and word all the things that you are trying to do you know for him uh, through words through your actions all that you are doing may he strengthen you in doing those things he says and he says may may you know may god encourage your hearts is what he says uh, so um, this is another lovely prayer that he has prayed for them over here at the end of uh, you know chapter 2 moving uh, into chapter 3 yes um if we can have someone read out chapter 3 verses 1 and 2 for me brothers this is to the words of the lord is speed of hope and be on as happened in many days and that we may be delivered from wicked and evil men who are not all have faith yeah um the first two three verses are talking about um you know uh, serving god uh, talking about uh, the spread of the gospel and the persecution that is there and then the rest of the thing the, the large chunk which comes after that is talking about um you know another aspect so just we'll first look at those you know first uh, two or three verses where the emphasis is more on spreading the gospel and the persecution that's going on so there are two prayer requests which paul makes for him you know for himself and his team he says you know please pray that uh, the message of the lord will spread rapidly 
and it will be honored you know when when, when we share it in different places uh, when others go out and and you know uh, share the gospel people should honor what has been uh, taught and they should be willing to believe it and receive it so pray please pray that the message of the lord will spread rapidly and the second thing that the second prayer request that he makes is you know pray that we will be delivered from wicked and evil people there will be people who will try to you know deceive um, who will try to uh, use um, all kinds of you know uh, wrong schemes to somehow suppress the gospel from being shared and we we see that happening you know even in our own uh, communities uh, there are people who are actively working behind the scenes to prevent the gospel from spreading uh, they are trying to come up with strategies to uh, you know limit and control the work that we can do openly you know uh, in sharing the gospel and uh, so uh, it is all right it is good to pray against such schemes and strategies to pray against such people uh, because over here paul is very clearly saying you know pray about this he says pray that we may be delivered from wicked and evil people for not everyone has faith um and then in verse 3 he, he goes on to say but the lord is faithful and he will strengthen you and protect you from the evil one uh, so the lord is faithful and he will strengthen us so that we will be able to withstand persecution he will protect us you know uh, from um, Uh, from harm and and danger uh, to the extent you know it depends on some situation in some situations he does allow the apostolic team you know to be persecuted but then there are other occasions when he actually you know uh, protects them especially on that occasion when they were supposed to you know be shipwrecked he is he uh, the lord makes sure that not none of them are harmed uh, so there is pro- divine protection given on certain occasions so god will do all of these things so from our side it is totally all right to pray that we will be delivered from the evil schemes and strategies that people are coming up with to stop the spread of the gospel we can actively pray and say lord deliver us you know deliver the people who are sharing the gospel deliver the ministers deliver the church members you know uh, in, in all these remote areas you know where uh, the persecution is more we it is all right to pray and say lord deliver these these believers and their churches from the wicked and the evil um because um paul would not have asked them to pray this prayer if if he if he if he thinks that god will not answer such a prayer so um it is in fact valid for us to pray that we will be kept and shielded from the uh, evil strategies of the wicked you know uh, who are trying to suppress the gospel um now coming to this um other you know thing which he really wants to talk about over here in this passage he seems to be focusing on people who are not willing to work they are not willing to put in the hard work and earn a livelihood and he seems to be quite upset about them if you notice uh, you know uh, throughout the um, letter of first thessalonians and in fact even even here in the in second thessalonians uh, his tone towards them has been loving um he has been um, you know he 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 likes who they are he takes pride in who they are uh, so very positive things are mentioned but over here in this last passage he is quite angry in the way he writes i you know because he is very much against this particular uh, section of people now these are people who are refusing to do their work you know um, they are trying to live off other people you know um in especially you know uh, us believers we are taught that we should be generous in giving that that we should be willing to help people and uh, so we 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 are more uh, willing to shell out our money you know to to not be very um, you know um, what very miserly in in the way we hold on to our money so what happens is that there are people in the church who take advantage of this you know and so rather than uh, working hard they would prefer to live off others and uh, paul is very much against this kind of a attitude so he talks very firmly about this i think um, in those days 
you know the impression was that any day now jesus is going to come you know in fact which is why that that wrong teaching began to go around where people were thinking oh maybe jesus already came and went away you know he collected his people and went away and we got left behind so that, you know they were like they were like thinking that in the very very near future jesus is going to come uh, they were living with that kind of an anticipation so i think the attitude among a uh, uh, one section of the people of the believers was that if he's coming soon why work till then we can kind of adjust you know these the, the other believers are anyway merciful and kind and loving they'll keep you know shelling out money and uh, you know we'll just live off them uh, so why should we put in the hard work you know so that was the kind of attitude uh, probably because they believed that the second coming is very very soon all right so here he says um that is not the right attitude and he goes on to talk about it uh, maybe we can look, we can begin by looking at verses um 6 and 7 yeah ma'am verses 6 and 7 now we command you brothers in the name of our lord jesus christ that you keep away from any brother who is walking in idleness and not in accord with the tradition that you received from us for you yourselves know how you ought to imitate us because we were not idle when we were with you exactly so these are not empty words that paul is speaking he literally set an example for them when he and his team were living with them they could easily have charged and said you know you know you need to pay us for the you know all the work of ministry that we are doing over here but he never asked for any kind of money in fact it says he he mentioned in the previous letter that whenever they took food from anyone they paid for the food which they took and so they and it and he says you know we worked day and night to support ourselves uh, for two reasons first not to be a burden to you because we didn't come to be a burden to you rather we came to be a blessing to you so we don't want to burden you so for the one reason why they work like that day and night and earn their livelihood is so that they will not be a burden the other uh, you know if you remember in the in the previous letter he says it is also to set an example he says you know uh, so that uh, you will uh, you know earn your livelihood the same way we also earned our livelihood so um, uh, so he says keep away from every believer who is idle and disruptive so these people who are idle who are not working you know they have too much free time on their hands and when a person has got too much free time on their hands then uh, the evil one can meddle with their mind and you know distract them with a whole bunch of other things a hard working person doesn't have much time for distractions you know because they have their work and they and, and and once they are finished with their work they are tired and they just want to rest on the other hand a person who's idle and really not doing anything much with their lives um, they can get into all kinds of wrong things so these people have become disruptive they're going around interfering with other people they're uh, where they are doing things which are actually bringing harm to the church and they're doing all of this because they have too much free time on their hands they are being idle and so he says over here keep away from such people now this is a rather strong wording you know it's saying he's saying don't associate with them don't be friends with them don't you know invite them to your house and sit over there and have a meal with them avoid them keep them away you know this is rather strong wording jay paul basically you know you should doesn't say that right he says you know all of you love each other you know be there for each other carry each other's burdens those are the kind of wordings that he generally uses but here regarding these people who are idle and disruptive he says keep away from them the less you have to do with them the better you know is is the is the implication over here um so uh, you know keeping that in mind let's also look at verses 8 9 and 10 yeah uh, verses 8 9 10 Eight, nine, ten. Now, did we eat any one bread free for of charge, but work with labor and toil night and day, that we might not be burdened to any of you? Not because we do not have authority, but make ourselves an example of how we should follow us. For even when we were with you, we commanded you this: if any one with Will not work. Neither shall he eat. 
yeah you know the the rule that he has uh, that he and his team had established earlier when they were staying with them the one who is unwilling to work shall not eat so if you want food if you want your basic needs met then go get a job and you know work uh, on the other hand if you don't want to work then fine then don't eat you know your your, your basic needs uh, let them just stay unmet so that is the kind of very firm uh, you know uh, condition that he places on on the on believers and uh, it is it is necessary for believers to you know have this kind of a um, of the, uh, have this kind of a standard because the uh, rest of the world is watching we saw that earlier you know in, in the other passage which we had talked about you know last time uh, where the world is watching and they will respect people you know who are uh, you know not dependent on anyone that was the wording that was there uh, in in uh, first thessalonians you know they are they are not dependent on anyone but they are earning and supporting themselves so such people you know the people who are watching them they will appreciate that uh, they will respect uh, them for it so he says you know it's so important the you know uh, for us to be in this way to live in this way because we are the church of god we are representing christ and uh, so the name of christ should be honored uh, by the way we live these idle people on the other hand they are causing disruption they are in some way causing harm to the to the believers by meddling in things you know uh, which they should not be meddling in um, and uh, just a minute yeah uh, so, uh, so he so he says over here. Um, you know, you need to follow this rule. The one who is unwilling to work shall not eat. Um, and then he goes on to say this in verses fourteen and fifteen. I mean, like very very serious instructions that are being given over here. Verses fourteen and fifteen. If anyone is not a believer, he says this message. Take note of that verse and have nothing to do with it, that he may be ashamed. Do not regard him as an enemy, but warn him as a brother. Yeah, so he, you know, uh, just now earlier he said, keep away from them. You know, as in, you know, don't don't make friends with them, you know, don't uh, spend time with them, avoid them, is what he said. Now he takes it one step further and he says, take special note of anyone who does not obey our instruction in this letter. So if someone, even after having read this letter out, you know, to all the people, if someone is still continuing in their idleness and, you know, and disrupting other people and doing all of that, take special note of such people. And it says, do not associate with them in order that they may feel ashamed because these people are um, seem to be quite happy with the way they are living. They don't feel any guilt about it. You know, I mean, there are these other believers who are working very hard and trying to earn, you know, in spite of all the persecution and suffering that they are pay facing in the middle of all of that, they are working hard to support themselves and their families. And what are these idle people doing? They're just living off them. And it's so unfair, right? Uh, so he says, do not associate with them in order that they may feel ashamed. If anyone, you know, if, if, if everyone starts, you know, uh, boycotting them, you know, refusing to talk to them, you know, inviting them for their, uh, for their fellowships and all of that, if they do that, then these people will realize, oh, what we are doing is wrong and they will feel ashamed. But immediately in the next verse, he says, yet do not regard them as an enemy but warn them as you would a fellow believer. So any kind of correction that is done in the Christian community must always be correction that is done to build up the person and not to crush the person. If all that we are achieving through our correction is you know, making that person feel uh, that they have no hope, that they are you know, worthless, then that's the, that, that, doesn't, that achieves nothing. So absolutely any correction that is done, you know, within the church, it is done always to build up the person, to help them see where they are wrong and to, you know, um, get them going in the right direction, you know, just to kind of make them aware, help, help them to become aware that they are, you know, um, 
having the wrong attitude or going down the wrong path and bringing them right onto the right path. All right. So the idea is that correction is always aimed at that so that they can get back onto the right path and be built up and make progress. Uh, uh, so the correction should never go to an extent where that person just feels crushed and feels excommunicated, where you know they, they feel that they're no law, no, I mean the church no longer cares about them. If that happens, then um, in fact, it kind of plays into Satan's hands, right? So, um, so we were, he, he says over here, uh, don't do this like as if they are enemies, but rather do it, you know, uh, understanding that they are fellow believers and you actually want to help them, you know, not to harm them. Uh, so he talks about that. Um, so, yeah, I think these are about the main things that we can, you know, look at in Second Thessalonians. So we are kind of at the end of our course. Um, so at this point, you know, if anyone has got any questions, anything that you would like to ask, um, yeah, you, you can actually go ahead. Otherwise, you know, we'll just close with a word of prayer. Okay, then shall we just close with a word of prayer? Yeah. Lord, we just thank you so much for the things that we could learn today uh, from Second Thessalonians. Uh, we thank you, Lord, uh, that you uh, will will you will empower us with your resurrection power, uh, so that the things that we are trying to do for you will indeed bear fruit. Um, that all these little steps that we take in faith to serve you. Uh, to 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 share the gospel in all of those things that we take up, Lord, you have promised that you will release your resurrection power to bring it to fruition, to make it fruitful. So we thank you, O oh Lord, for this for this assurance that we have in you. Also, O oh Lord, we pray that um, uh, we will be people uh, who will um, will set godly standards uh, and live in a way that will bring honor to your name. Uh, you know, from the people who are watching us. So we pray, O oh Lord, that we would conduct our lives in that manner. Also, Lord, uh, we pray that um, even as we wait for the second coming, uh, we will we will be people who are uh, living in preparedness, where, uh, O oh Lord, uh, we are living in a way that will um, that that will make you happy when you finally come to receive us. Because it says, Lord, in your in your word we saw today that when uh, you finally come, we will marvel at you and we will glorify you. We will be filled with joy at that time. So we pray that we would prepare ourselves in such a way that it will be a joyful thing for us when you finally come. Lord, help us to remember all of these things. Bring it all back to our minds, so Lord, as and when we require to be reminded of these truths. And we pray that you would bless uh, every student, O oh Lord. Uh, who has gone through this course and even as they continue oh lord with their ministries with their education uh, with with their various responsibilities lord may your strengthening be with be there with them in all in all that they do oh lord thank you lord in jesus name amen amen yes thank you so amen. much amen thank you yes. so much ma'am thank, thank you. you yes we really learned so many Insights. Thank you, Pastor. Really a blessing. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank you.